Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 771 for June 9th, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. I call them my strand of fam and they always will be my strand of fam. And really, um, uh, it was it was a bittersweet decision, of course, but I, uh, I'm really excited about the new opportunity uh, to work with uh, with Metallica and work with Sweet Amber Distilling to, to create a world-class American blend. This week, Rob Dietrich was named as the new master distiller and blender for Metallica's blackened American whiskey brand. But don't call him a replacement for the late Dave Pickerel, who worked with the iconic rock band to create blackened, before his death last November. The former master distiller for Stranahan's in Denver would prefer to be thought of as Dave Pickerel's successor. And he'll join us later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. Believe it or not, it's not the first time Rob Dietrich has worked with Metallica, but you'll have to keep listening to hear that story. I'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and much more, all on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Make this Father's Day unforgettable with a personalized bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. Go to reservebar.com and use code GIFTDAD for exclusive pricing on an engraved bottle. Because if anyone deserves Blue Label, it's Dad. Please drink responsibly. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo, Norwalk, Connecticut. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. When the Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau unveiled its proposed rewrite of U.S. alcohol regulations last December, the agency noted that one of the things it did not address in that proposal was the so-called standards of fill. Those standards decree what size bottles, whiskeys, and other distilled spirits can legally be sold in, and that's where the requirement for 750 milliliter bottles comes from, along with a rigid list of other sizes ranging from 50 milliliters to 1.75 liters. At the time, TTB officials hinted that they would address that issue in a separate rulemaking process, and we now have more details to report. The U.S. government's Office of Management and Budget maintains what's known as the Unified Agenda. It's a schedule of regulatory changes in the works across federal agencies, and the TTB's proposal to change the standards of fill requirement has now reached the Unified Agenda. Now, it's a bit of a shocker since the TTB staff is tentatively recommending to get rid of standard bottle sizes for distilled spirits, except for currently unspecified minimum and maximum sizes. The justification for the change? To give spirits producers more flexibility in production and sourcing containers, give consumers more purchasing options, and get rid of outdated restrictions that inhibit competition. That means importers might soon be able to start bringing more whiskeys from around the world to the U.S. market, since the proposal would clear the way for the European Union standard 700 ml size bottles that have not been allowed in the U.S. since the switch to metric sizing in 1980. Mark Watt of Caddenheads, the Scotland-based independent bottler and retailer, told us that could be a game-changer. In a way, the U.S. is possibly missing out a bit uh, on the selection that we bottle for the rest of the world because of the 750 thing holds us back. Um, so I think, for me, it could be brilliant um, in that, you know, even just trickling in small amounts into America, but lots of lots of different products. Uh, I'm just looking at my desk here. I've got a 1991 canvas in front of me, which is gorgeous. You know, we're probably not going to bottle a whole cask of that. We might bottle a whole cask of that for America, but if we're bottling a whole a single cask for the world in 700s, we're not going to bother putting it in 750s. Um, so that would be, you know, the, an example of one 
just off of something on my desk that America might miss out on because uh, of the problems of having to do 750s and 70s. Explain that problem because you actually have to get different bottles completely. You can't just fill yeah, the, fill the same to, bottle to 700 and we, to 750. We, we have different bottles and you have to get different labels. Uh, I know it doesn't sound like much, but uh, it, it all adds up to being a pain. You've got to reset your bottling line to, to fit the, the different bottles, etc., etc. So it, it's much easier to bottle larger amounts of the same thing in one go. Uh, you know, so, you know, to, fairly, we're, we're selling quite a lot uh, for us, you know, not, not compared to the big boys, obviously, uh, in the US. But, you know, last year for the rest of the world, we maybe had 200 different bottlings where we maybe had 15 for the US, if that makes sense. Um, so this would allow us much more flexibility um, so if America wanted to jump on top of a bottling that we've done that, you know, we may have a little bit of stock left, um, they can take it instead of us then having to go and rework it or plan in advance what America wants or what we need to do for America. So it would just allow a lot more flexibility um, for selling into the market. The change would also make it easier for U.S. craft distillers who want to export their whiskies to produce a single 700 ml bottle that could be sold almost anywhere, since the only other country that requires 750 ml bottles is South Africa. Now, there is opposition to the proposal from the Distilled Spirits Council, the trade association representing U.S. distillers. The council's Lisa Hawkins told us in an email that while there is support for expanding the current approved container sizes, her group does not like the idea of setting only minimum and maximum sizes. Hawkins did not explain the rationale, but said that will be part of the comments the council files with the TTB when that process begins. I should note that just because the proposal appears on the unified agenda, it hasn't been officially published as a, quote, notice of proposed rulemaking, TTB spokesman Thomas Hogue told us in an email that no date for that has been set yet. That's what would open up the public comment period, and Hogue also reminds us that approval of the proposal is not a foregone conclusion. We'll have some of your comments about this story later on during Your Voice. On that note, here's a reminder about the TTB's main proposal to rewrite federal alcoholic beverage regulations for the first time since 1935. While that proposal was published back in December, the public comment period was extended until June 26th because the TTB was part of the federal government shutdown earlier this year. In other words, you still have a couple of weeks left to get your comments in. Here's one quick update on the political front. We mentioned last time around that Mexico might reimpose its tariffs on American-made whiskeys that were removed just a couple of weeks ago. That is not likely to happen now that there has been an agreement between the Trump administration and the Mexican government on Central American migration. President Donald Trump had threatened to slap a 5% tariff on all Mexican imports starting this week, without that agreement, but the deal ends that possibility for now. While multinational companies have been part of the Scotch whiskey industry for decades, we are now seeing what might just be the beginning of Chinese investment. The Chinese buyout firm Hill House Capital has bought Loch Lomond distillers for 395 million pounds. That's around 503 million dollars. The deal comes five years after Loch Lomond was acquired from its founding family by Exponent, a private equity firm. Loch Lomond produces its namesake single malt and the Inchmurin single malt at the Loch Lomond distillery and also owns the Glen Scotia distillery in Campbellton along with other spirits brands. Loch Lomond CEO Colin Matthews was not available for an interview but said in a news release that the deal will help it expand its international presence, especially in Asia. Last November, we featured Starward Distillery founder David Vitale in episode 737. 
Now the Australian distillery's whiskies are finally available in the U.S., starting with the Nova single malt. It's the most ambitious release of an Australian whiskey in the U.S. market so far, but as with most young distilleries, supplies are tight. The short answer is we ran out of stock. Um, we had a great uh, late, late uh, spring in, in Australia, which meant that we were really struggling to keep up with demand in Australia as well as the United States. So notwithstanding, we'd been out and about and, and, and uh, starting to do a bit of a soft launch. Uh, we're really committed to the market now, have enough inventory to see it through and really want to make sure that um, when we make a commitment to a market that we've got the availability to push it through. So it's available in the U.S. as of when? Right now. Um, we're we're uh, broadly available in California, Illinois, New York, Texas, Washington State, Colorado is coming online shortly, um, Florida, and from there we, a, a broader rollout. This is the first Australian whiskey that's had a wide-scale release in the United States. What do you expect that to do? I'm really excited for the Australian whiskey category, actually. Like, for me... Of course, it's about Starwood, but, you know, as Bill Lark once told me, you know, a, a, a category of one does not build an industry. And, you know, um, in that context, for me, I really want to make sure that we're able to celebrate Australian whiskey in all of its fashions, not just Starwood. And, you know, um, being able to be here and celebrate the whiskey and share it with uh, people that, you know, know their, know their whiskies and, and are excited about it being on shelves, I hope means that more whiskies can follow. You'll find my tasting notes for Starward Nova at the WhiskeyCast website. Meanwhile, there's also a charity auction wrapping up later this week at whiskey.auction for eight two-packs of Starward's Seafarer Edition, which Vitaly and his team created in a partnership with the Cunard Cruise Line. For the next two years, Melbourne is going to be one of their largest home ports in the Southern Hemisphere for uh, the the uh, queens, the Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, and I've forgotten the name of the other queen. But given that, they wanted to add a Melbourne flair to the offering on the ship. And obviously, um, whiskey is a big part of, of uh, the naval experience, and they asked if we'd be interested in having the stock on board. And... Um, we're not called Starwood for nothing, Mark, and I kind of pitched them the idea that what about if we put a barrel on the aft deck of the Queen Elizabeth and had it travel around the world for a year, and that's the whiskey that the patrons of the ship had to offer alongside the standard Starwood Nova. There was lots of logistical challenges, as you'd expect, but it was a great idea, and, and um, one of the things that I was... Uh, really made this idea something that worked for both of us was that we both wanted it to do good as well. So it wasn't just a marketing ploy or something that we could have exclusively for patrons on the ship, but something that could do some good. So we both agreed to pick a charity of choice. The proceeds from the auction will benefit the SCARF community in Australia and the Benevolent Society in the UK. Last year, we reported that Independent Stave was planning to expand its cooperage operations in Kentucky. This week, the company broke ground on a new $67 million cooperage in Moorhead, Kentucky. It'll be Independent Stave's third cooperage in Kentucky, along with two stave mills that supply the cooperages. The new Commonwealth cooperage is expected to create more than 200 jobs, and state officials provided about $3.5 million in tax incentives to help support the project. Now, we often report on projects that get state or local tax breaks or other economic incentives to expand their facilities, and they're often based on those projects creating new jobs. But we don't usually get public confirmation later on that those jobs were actually created. This week, we did. Back in 2015, city and county officials in Waco, Texas, agreed to a $300,000 incentive package for Balcones Distilling when it was building its new distillery in downtown Waco. 
At the time, Balconis had 13 employees and pledged to add 12 more workers at the new distillery. According to the Waco Tribune, McLennan County Commissioners got the report card for Balconis this week, and it's fair to say the distillery got straight A's. Balconis added 15 employees instead of 12, with an average salary $10,000 higher than promised, and exceeded its targets for hiring local residents. As a result, the commissioners voted to release their half of that funding, $150,000, while the city is providing the other half. That money is being reinvested into a tasting room upgrade and an on-site brewery. Balconis won't be competing with other local brewers, though. Its beer will only be available on tap at the distillery's tasting room starting in November. And, by the way, Balconis is releasing a new single malt whiskey. High Plains Texas single malt is distilled from barley grown and malted in Texas. It'll go on sale at the distillery's release party June 22nd and will sell for $79.99 a bottle at the distillery. Rocktown Distillery in Little Rock, Arkansas, will be having a party of its own on June 22nd to celebrate the distillery's ninth anniversary and will be releasing its ninth anniversary single malt that day. It's been matured for two years in ex-bourbon casks and a final year in a cognac cask and will sell for $69.99 a bottle in Rocktown's tasting room. Also on the American malt whiskey front, Virginia's Catoctin Creek will release its second batch of Dia de los Muertos American Malt Whiskey on July 6th at the distillery in Purcellville, Virginia. It's a collaboration with their neighbors at Adrot Theory Brewing Company and uses their Russian Imperial Stout beer. The whiskey distilled from that beer was matured for four and a half years. Only 147 bottles will be available at the release party, and that same day, the brewery is also releasing 190 bottles of Dia de los Muertos Russian Imperial Stout, aged in Catoctin Creek maple whiskey barrels. Here's another tie-up between whiskey makers and brewers. Dublin Liberty's distillery owner Quintessential Brands has joined forces with three Irish craft brewers to produce the Dubliner Whiskey's Beer Cask series, the series will feature Dubliner finished in casks that held either Rascals Brewing's Coffee Stout, O'Hara's Irish Stout, or Five Lamps Pale Ale. They'll be available starting next month at the Dublin Liberties Distillery, and will also be available in France, Australia, and in global travel retail. Compass Box is releasing The Circle, a limited edition blended malt that comes out of its bartender collaboration program, of the same name. That program puts bartenders through a series of creative challenges, and the winner gets a chance to create a special whiskey. Rosie Mitchell of Three Sheets in London won the 2018 competition and blended some malt whiskey from Tam Du in Speyside together with three Highland malts from Undisclosed to Distillers. The Circle is available now in the UK and other global markets, It'll reach the U.S. next month. The price tag? Around $150 a bottle. Beam Suntory is releasing Basil Hayden's Caribbean Reserve Rye. Now, from the name, you might think it's finished in rum casks, but it's not. It blends 8-year-old Kentucky rye with 4-year-old Canadian rye and a touch of blackstrap rum. It has a recommended retail price of $44.99 a bottle in the U.S. Templeton Rye has released its 2019 Limited Edition Barrel Strength Whiskey. It's bottled at 57.9% ABV and will sell for around $60 a bottle. I received a sample this week, and I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at WhiskeyCast.com. Crown Royal has released the fourth edition in its Noble Collection range. This year's release is finished in French Oak Casks, and will be available in limited quantities for about $60 a bottle in the U.S. No word yet on pricing or availability in Canada. And finally, we need to send our congratulations to Johnny Walker Master Blender, Dr. Jim Beveridge. 
Friday night, he was named as one of the newest members of the Order of the British Empire in Queen Elizabeth's birthday honors list. Don't look for the soft-spoken blender to make a big deal out of this, though. As he told us back in 2015, he is not one to seek the spotlight. My legacy sits uh, within the members of the blending team. So I think I want, if I, if I did want to be met, remembered in any way, it would be remembered through the skills of the team. That, that, I think, would be the greatest achievement. You can watch the entire WhiskeyCast HD interview with Jim Beveridge on YouTube or at WhiskeyCast.com. And, of course, that's also where you can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Keeping American whiskey history and tradition alive isn't just a marketing slogan. It's part of Heaven Hill's fabric. When other distillers were getting out of the rye whiskey business, Heaven Hill saved the legendary Rittenhouse rye from becoming a footnote in the history books. Today, it's the rye whiskey of choice in a cocktail, or neat, with a distinct spicy flavor all its own. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events. Whiskey Life Brisbane is this Friday and Saturday in Brisbane, Australia. Buffalo Trace Distillery hosts its annual Pappy for Your Pappy Father's Day Dinner and Tasting on Friday night at the distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky. The Edinburgh Whiskey Festival is Saturday in Edinburgh, Scotland, along with the Virginia Craft Spirits Roadshow in Newport News, Virginia. The Fraser History Museum in Louisville, Kentucky hosts a vintage bourbon tasting and book signing with Jim Rutledge and bourbon justice author Brian Hara on June 20th. High Coast Distillery in Hoga Kusten, Sweden, has its annual Whiskey Festival June 28th and 29th. Whiskey Freedom 2019 is on the 29th in Perth, Australia, followed by Whiskey Live Sydney on the 5th and 6th of July. Finally, the Whiskey Rebellion Festival is July 11th through the 14th in Washington, Pennsylvania. Right now, we have 192 events worldwide on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or another whiskey-related event that you'd like to add to the list, all you have to do is let us know about it. Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Make this Father's Day an unforgettable one. Mark the moment with a personalized bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, a luxurious blend of some of the rarest and most exceptional whiskeys sourced from Johnny Walker's unparalleled reserves. Let Dad know how much he means to you with a personalized engraving on the bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. Go to reservebar.com and use code GIFTDAD for an exclusive pricing on an engraved bottle. Because if anyone deserves Blue Label, it's Dad. Please drink responsibly. Johnny Walker Blue Label, blended scotch whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, imported by Diageo, Norwalk, Connecticut. Grab a bourbon and settle into a good story. Heaven Hill's backroom stories, told by those who've rarely shared before, just how they shape the spirit and just how the spirit shapes them. All the barrels are aging here. A lot of the airflow through the warehouse like this, you know, when you open a door, all that goodness hits you in the face. And, you know, it's something you never forget. Download and listen to the new podcast, Tales from the Hill, from Heaven Hill Distillery. It's coming soon to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Last month, we looked at how Whistlepig Rye is moving on after the death of master distiller Dave Pickerel, who worked with distilleries all over North America and the world as a consultant. Whistlepig Farm in Vermont is also the interim home of blackened American whiskey, which Dave Pickerel created in a collaboration with members of the rock band Metallica. It's where the blending and the proprietary sonic treatment process for Blackened is done, 
along with the bottling. And this week we got word that Metallica is moving ahead as well. The band has named Rob Dietrich of Stranahan's Distillery in Denver as the new master distiller and blender for Blackened. And I talked with Rob in one of his first interviews after the announcement. I don't think anybody can replace Dave Pickerel, but uh, you're a worthy successor. Let's put it that way. Well, very kind. I, I would agree with that. Uh, Dave is definitely uh, not replaceable. He is, uh, you know, legend in the in the industry, and um, it's you know it's an honor to to continue to uphold his legacy. How did all this come about? We all thought you were happy at Stranahan's. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I, it's still my first love. You know, there's there's no getting away from that. I, I love Stranahan's. It's um, it's you know love of my life. But I now was approached by uh, their sales director. You know, after uh, Dave's untimely passing and. Um, they started talking to me about, uh, taking over the role and, uh, really just made a, an offer that, uh, that I couldn't refuse. Did you have to go through the, uh, interview process with the band? Um, I did go through the interview process. I know that they were, um, you know, the, the, the CEO, the sales director, we were interviewing uh, several other distillers as well and trying to narrow down the, uh, the prospects. And, uh, and this was, uh, for me, it was really exciting. I think it was about a four month process of, of going through, uh, different interviews. And then the final interview was with the, with the band themselves and, um, really got along with the band. Um, and they were really excited to, to bring me aboard. Were you a Metallica fan before this? I know uh, you were definitely. interested in music, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, my music background, I've I definitely crossed their paths and, uh, um, you know, in the I grew up. You know, seventh grade I think was the first time I heard uh, Master of Puppets, and I was, you know, I've absolutely loved their music ever since I was a kid. So, what do you think it's going to be like working with them? Uh, you know, so far it's been really exciting. They're, you know, they're they're very interested in the, in the collaboration aspect of of the uh, of the whiskey, and you know, having their fingerprints on the process. Um, they're very interested in the in every part of the process, and really are uh, pretty hands on. So, I think. I'm really excited about that. I know that, uh, you know, really, you know, my, my job as the, the, the master distiller is to continue to, um, to uphold the, the, you know, the, the quality and consistency of black end, as well as to create um, unique and unusual expressions uh, in the future as well. So have you been brought up to speed on the, uh, the process, the uh, sonic enhancement process? I know that uh, they were working on a patent for it when Dave died. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually heading out to uh, Vermont next week, so that'll be my first time doing a site visit. So they are uh, bringing me up to speed as quickly as possible. So I will, I'll, be, I'll be digging into that. I'll be putting on my, my whiskey nerd hat and, uh, and digging into the process. Had you uh, had any experience at all with uh, sonic enhancement or any of the sound technology that some people are using besides, uh, besides Blackened? No, you know... I certainly heard of it, um, you know, prior to this, other people, you know, playing music to barrels and that sort of thing. I've always been curious about different, um, different methods. You know, I've, um, for a while I was kind of looking into a controlled cavitation as a, as a, as a, you know, this was years ago, just as I just started kind of going down a rabbit hole and looking at different things. And I really kind of feel it has a similar method in, in a sense. And, you know, and when it was explained to me, when it first, when I first heard about it, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted to know the science behind it. I wanted to understand that this was something that actually affected the whiskey. Um, and, and it, and it truly does. It's, um, you know, which is why they were doing the patent that it actually does make a difference. So you've seen the uh, scientific stuff that uh, documents it, right? I haven't seen the document. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been, um, I, I will see that. I think when I get out to Vermont, but it, um, as my understanding, that's exactly what, uh, Dave had requested, um, and when he got it back, when he got that, that information back, he was ecstatic. I mean, there was a definitive, you know, they, they used a control barrel, of course, and then, and then the, uh, the sonic enhancement for the other barrel. And, uh, there was a definitive difference, um, when he, when he had the lab send back the results. So I'm very curious to see all that information when I get, uh, when I get up there. I know it's probably too soon to even ask this, but, uh, what's the status on the, what's, I guess they were going to call the Dave Pickerel distillery that is being planned out in the Bay area. Um, yeah, it is a little too soon right now. I know that, um, it, that is well, the band does want to, uh, build a distillery. And of course, for me, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to having a, um, a distillery around me and being able to work, uh, work within those, you know, within the walls of that. And, 
Uh, so right now, I, I think um, it had been on hold until they had gotten a uh, someone in the in the role of the master distiller, and you know that's kind of next phase is kind of seeing where that's going to go. So right now, it's, it is a little too soon, but we are, um, you know, that is that's in discussion. Are you going to be based in Vermont, or are you going to stay in Denver until uh, something happens out in the Bay Area? Uh, currently, I'll be based in Denver, so I can uh, I can establish a lab there at my house. Um, you know, get samples sent to a, a local distillery from you know DSP to DSP, and then I'll be able to uh, mess around with the blends. Uh, really uh, wrap my mind around how the blend um, is put together, and then being able to head out to Vermont anytime we put together a batch, uh, do the cask finishing. Uh, and the sonic enhancement, and then uh, and then bottling it. So I'll be currently based in Denver. So you know, it, it keeps me centrally located. Uh, the band is, you know, their headquarters is in San Rafael. So uh, you know, it's easier for me to go back and forth between West Coast and East Coast from uh, from Denver for the time being. What was the mood at Stranahan's when you gave your notice? I assume it was this week, or has this, has they known about this for a while? Yeah, it's been a few weeks, um, and I and. You know, Proximo Spirits, you know, Stranahan's worked together with Sweet Amber Distilling to make sure that, you know, press release was aligned and uh, that there were no hard feelings. Of course, you know, I, I'm, you know, Stranahan's is my first love and it always, you know, always will be. And I think um, there was, uh, people were very excited for me. Um, at the same time, they were, um, you know, there was a great deal of sadness that I was leaving. And I, um, I you know, I, I called them my Strana fam and they always will be my Strana fam. And really, um, uh, it was it was a bittersweet decision, of course, but I uh, I'm really excited about the new opportunity uh, to work with uh, with Metallica and work with Sweet Amber Distilling to to create a world class American blend. So now you're going to have to wait in line for the Snowflake editions each December, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see how they're uh, how they're going to do that. Uh, you know that that's been my baby for a long time, and I um, I really I'm really curious to see where they what direction they go with it. And I would I would love to see uh, uh, what exciting things they come up with for that. Any word on who's going to take over for you at Stranahan's? Uh, not a, not currently. I I am honestly don't know. I'm not even sure what they're thinking. Uh, you know, I, I played kind of a lot of roles uh, with with Stranahan's. Um, you know, kind of was the the national ambassador, face of the brand, as well as operations at the distillery. So uh, I think they're trying to you know they're possibly probably going to fill that with a few few different people. The question I have is that. Uh... When you leave a distillery, how important is it to you to have somebody there who could replace you and have a succession plan in place so that yeah, if you move important. on as you're doing with this, making sure that there's somebody there to continue on that tradition that you set forth at Stranahan's? You know, I, I, I agree. That's, um, you know, I, I wasn't the, uh, the, the, the first um, uh, distiller there that, you know, it, for me it was a um, I, the way I kind of considered, I wasn't the first steward of Stranahan's and I, and I won't be the last. And, uh, you know, just like any whiskey that, that you want to establish to, to last a lifetime or, or beyond a lifetime. Um, you know, I think always knowing that you're setting up a successor, uh, to succeed, um, is really, is really key because I, I absolutely love that brand and I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's my heart. So I want to, you know, I want to make sure that who's, who's taking it over really has the same kind of passion and, and, and focus and, and, and I, and I know there are a few folks there that, um, that fit that bill. Um, and, and really, it's going to be up to Stranahan's to make that decision. And you'll be available to answer questions, I would assume? Always. Absolutely. So what's the best part of taking this gig? Is it getting to go to the concerts? Is it getting to make the whiskey? Is it getting to uh, try something new? What's going to be the best part of this gig? I think what's the most exciting is that, you know, you know I'm, I'm used to doing things from grain to bottle uh, in the process um, hands on that process. What's exciting about this is that, um, this is a, an opportunity to be able to take blends or take whiskeys from all over the world and create, uh, a, you know, a world-class blend, just like we've already done with, uh, with Blackened that, that Dave did with Blackened, um, and collaborating with, with the band. I really feel like, um, the, the, the sky's the limit. You know, I can, I can kind of look at the world and, and create, um, these really unusual and fun and unique blends. And that's, that's kind of the, the new, you know, I think new era of whiskey. I think there's been so much tradition, uh, you know, so steeped in tradition that uh, being able to allow growth in any industry, I think, is, is by being innovative and, and being uh, willing to, to do, you know, things that just aren't, that aren't the norm. And so I think that's what I'm excited about the most. 
How critical will it be for you to continue what Dave Pickerel started with Blackened, or do you get to use what Dave created with the initial blend of Blackened and use that as the jumping off point to uh, expand and grow on it, or do you feel constrained to stick with what Dave did? Well, I think, you know, just in, in order to keep that, that same consistency of what Dave created, that's, you know, it's, it's important that, um, that I understand every aspect of how, you know, how he put that together. So I think it's really important to, to maintain that, um, uh, the integrity of the whiskey and, uh, and really where I'll, I'll be able to get creative is, is creating those other expressions, um, in time. Uh, so really my main focus is, is, is just ensuring that, um, the process uh, remains the same and, and, and dialing it in. I think, you know, even Dave was, was probably you know, just like any, any good distiller, you're, you're, you're dialing in uh, the process when you're only a few batches in, you're still tweaking it and dialing it in. So I think that's, um, that's, you know, again, maintaining what, uh, what he's already created. I have heard that this will not be your first go with music enhancement. Uh, I have heard that you wanted to experiment once with putting some barrels underneath the stage out at Red Rocks Amphitheater in Denver. You know, it, it was something we were talking about. Um, you know, Stranahan's is the original, or it's the you know official whiskey of Red Rocks, and so it was one of those things that we we talked about as a as a possibility. But uh, legally, that's really it would have been very difficult. You have to you have to license and register a, a barrel storage uh, facility. So it's it was more of, a, of an exciting kind of uh, pipe dream in a way. But it would be uh, it's something that, that would have been very fun. But you would have only had exposure to the music for a few hours at a time and not really enough consistency to uh, to really do anything serious with it, right? It would have been right, more fun. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and really, you know, it's, uh, it was more just of a, an idea. And I think any time you're, you're coming up with ideas, it's really thinking outside the box and figuring out, uh, is that going to work or is it just more of a, an idea? Um, so I, I don't think it would have really made a, a difference, uh, but it would have been, would have been a fun thing to do. Would have been a great, uh, Stranahan's Red Rocks edition or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let's talk about your background in music, because I don't think a lot of people realized that, or realize that, uh, you had a background in music before you got into distilling. Yeah. Um, you know, I started out in, I think 19, 1996 in San Francisco with Bill Graham Presents. Um, at the Tibetan Freedom Concert, and uh, and from that point, uh, I was hooked. I mean, it was it was a, you know I was on a mountain biking road trip at the time, happened to have my climbing gear with me because uh, I was an avid mountain climber, rock climber. I just happened to meet the right person. I met the wife of uh, uh, of the guy who was managing Bill Graham Presents at the time, and and she said, yeah, they need help. This is a huge it's a huge concert. So I'll introduce you. And he uh, and he said, oh, you you uh, you have a you have climbing gear. You know how to climb. I said, yeah. He said, well, okay, you're a rigger. And so, so I was, I was like, wait, I can get paid to climb. So I was, uh, I was pretty excited about that. Uh, and from there, it just really kind of evolved. I got, uh, so I worked as a stagehand, as a rigger for, for many years, and then uh, started getting into stage management um, and venue management, event management, um, and really uh, getting into any kind of role I could that I could, uh, you know, so I was, I was kind of an independent contractor for about 10 years. Uh, so worked with a, a lot of bands when they would come through, you know, a lot of epic bands during those times in the 90s. There were still a lot of uh, really epic, you know, people touring like Etta James and James Brown and uh, Allman Brothers. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of really fun concerts worked uh, worked with Metallica in 1996. Uh, I think the year they cut their hair and it was uh, and I was I was a stagehand, uh, you know, pushing boxes uh, uh, for the show. So it was kind of a full circle uh, experience to be able to come back and be able to uh, work and collaborate with the band on, on creating a, creating this whiskey. Did you remind them of that during the interview? I did not that they would have known who I was, but, uh, um, I did, uh, I did mention that as well. And it was, uh, it was kind of a fun part of, uh, one fun part of the interview. I joked in our web story that you had this background, but that that's not why the band needs you. They need you to make good whiskey now. Yes, I read that, uh, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, I've spent the last you know twelve years, twelve plus years, uh, honing just my skills in in um, you know in distilling and 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 tasting. You know, uh, you know when I when I create a snowflake, it is you know the marriage of all these different barrels and different cask finishes. So I've really been fine tuning uh, my palate uh, just just from uh, you know from experience, just from from doing it, and uh, so that's. 
it's it's exciting to you know have that 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 music background but it is you know the reason i'm I'm here is to make good whiskey thanks to rob dietrich of black and american whiskey for joining us on whiskey cast in depth and as soon as stranahan's names his successor in denver we'll have that news for you on whiskey cast too whiskey cast in depth is brought to you by mortlock whiskey's best kept secret hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous scotch whiskies comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the Blood Oath Packed Number no. 5 Bourbon from Luxco and Lux Road Distillers. It's finished in Caribbean rum casks and bottled at 49.3% ABV. The nose is very aromatic with notes of molasses, brown sugar, charred oak, pipe tobacco, and subtle spices. The taste is peppery with cinnamon and black pepper that dominate the palate and fade slowly to reveal hints of baked apples, molasses, brown sugar, and just a hint of chocolate. The finish is long and spicy with sweet touches underneath. I'm scoring the Blood Oath Packed Number no. 5 Bourbon a 93. This year's second release of Booker's Bourbon is nicknamed the Shiny Barrel Batch for the honey barrels that Booker no used to find in his rickhouses. He knew those were the good ones because the rickhouse dust had been rubbed off the barrels when his warehouse guys leaned over them to sneak a dram or two. This batch is six and a half years old, and it's bottled at 62% ABV, uncut and unfiltered. The nose has a gentle oakiness and touches of vanilla, caramel, subtle spices, and honey. The taste is thick, spicy, and intense with black pepper, chili powder, and a hint of cardamom, while touches of burnt vanilla, caramel, honey, and charred oak come alive as the spices start to fade. The finish is long and oaky with lingering spices and hints of vanilla and honey. I'm scoring Booker's Batch 2019-2, the Shiny Barrel Batch, a 93. Finally, I had a chance to taste the new George Dickel Bottled and Bond Tennessee Whiskey. It's 13 years old, and of course it's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of citrus fruits, honey, vanilla, gentle spices, and just a hint of oak. The taste, thick and chewy with strong baking spices, oak tannins, vanilla, and hints of citrus in the background. The finish is long and subtle with lingering spices and a hint of cherries. I'm scoring the George Dickel Bottled and Bond Tennessee Whiskey a 91. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of 2,600 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out today at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Le Stow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. And returning to our lead story earlier, the possibility that the U.S. market might be opened up to whiskeys bottled in Europe's standard 700 ml size bottles, generated a lot of comments after we posted a story Wednesday at WhiskeyCast.com. Peter Boyer in the UK had this comment on our Facebook page, and then we might also get the EU to allow 750 ml in Europe, and then everyone over here would be happy too. Well, that's not likely, Peter. Changes in European Union regulations require all 27, or 28 depending on Brexit, member nations to agree. And that's not likely to happen. From Jeff Burlatt in Houston, Sanity in the rules? What is the world coming to? From Robert Mark in Maryland, 
I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic instead of giddily excited. That is probably a good idea. Remember, the Distilled Spirits Council is not thrilled with this idea. As we reported during the news, the trade organization is okay with adding some more sizes to the current list, but is not crazy about having just a minimum and maximum bottle size. We also had some response from people within the industry who liked the idea, though. Raj Saberwal of Glass Revolution Imports, at Whiskey Raj on Twitter, had this to say. Mark, this is long overdue and, as you mentioned, will allow for greater availability of spirits in the USA. This includes 700 ml and 500 ml sizes. Wine and sake are allowed to be imported in a variety of sizes. Why not spirits? Chris Reesbeck of Westland Distillery in Seattle had this tweet. We love this, Mark, hoping that everyone sees the value of this long term. Great for the whiskey community. And as I mentioned during the news, if this change does go into effect, it would leave South Africa as the only nation requiring the use of 750 ml bottles. Andy Watts of South Africa-based Distel told us on Facebook this might force the South African government to change its rules. Quote, would be a game changer for South Africa in terms of hashtag just do it. The issue may be hashtag just do it. But Mark, at FR1 Day, Friday, on Twitter, is worried. He tweeted this, Great news for whiskey lovers in the States, but as a South African, I have concerns that it will impact negatively on the whiskey is available here in South Africa if all of a sudden there is no need or requirement to produce 750 ml fill sizes as is required by South African law. Early days, though. We'll keep an eye on this one. Also, we heard from Judd Laughter, a longtime listener from Tennessee, who's on the road traveling in Iceland. Here's what he had to say. Hey, Mark. Today I visited the Eimwerk Distillery in Reykjavik and did their tour and tasting. Five whiskeys, three gins, and a Brennevin. The whiskeys included their one-year-old young whiskey aged in new oak barrels and their single malt aged three years in the barrels previously used for the young whiskey. They also have a pair of smoked young whiskey single malt that they malted themselves using sheep dung as the heat source. Hashtag, because Iceland. They don't have much wood or peat, so they use what they have. The whiskeys were young, but impressive. Definitely different than anything I've tasted before. Finally, the last whiskey was their single malt finished in a birch barrel, birch being the only native tree in Iceland, it was an excellent dram with a smooth cinnamon, maybe, flavor to it. When I asked about the barrel, do they have a local cooperage, the tour guide said they made and charred the barrels themselves. That I'd like to see. Definitely worth the hour if any listeners are coming through Iceland. It's even on the road between the International Airport and Reykjavik. Judd included a link for the distillery's website, and we'll include it in our show notes for this episode at WhiskeyCast.com. I smell a road trip coming on. If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast, or you can always send us an email. The address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And this time it's a science-slash-medicine question that was sent in by a listener. And since it involves medicine, I'm not going to use their name. But here's the email. I'm an avid scotch drinker and whiskey cast listener who just found out I have an allergy to barley. Talk about a disappointment. While I'm hopeful to still be able to have some scotch, 
I need to find a few go-to barley-free whiskeys. I have been focused on 100% rye as a starting point. I tend to like older whiskeys, don't we all? It looks like several bottlings of Whistlepig rye fit the bill, though the old world has some barley, I believe. Redemption 18 years old rye was another that hit my radar. In general, it seems to be difficult to find out which ones have barley in them. Are there other premium ryes or other whiskeys you would recommend? Anything else that I should be exploring? I know I can do tequila and vodka, but that's just not the same thing. Well, I really feel your pain here, and I wish I could offer more guidance. There are very few 100% rye whiskeys available. Part of that is because rye is hard to distill on its own, so most distillers who work with rye max out at 95% rye. The rest is malted barley, and that's because barley has natural enzymes that help produce alcohol during the fermentation process, and without it, distillers would have to add those enzymes in separately, and that's not always legal, depending on where you're located. As a result, almost every whiskey has at least a small amount of malted barley, unless the label clearly says 100% rye. Now, let me emphasize that I am not offering medical advice. But for anyone with a barley allergy, it might be worth talking with your doctor to see just how sensitive your tolerance levels are. I'm basing that on previous issues over gluten in whiskey from those who have to live a gluten-free lifestyle. While whiskey is not certified in the U.S. as gluten-free, distillers who have had chemical analysis done on their spirits indicate that as alcohol evaporates from the wash during distilling, it does not contain any of that wash's gluten content, and that might well be the case with barley as well. Once again, you really need to talk to your doctor before taking a chance with anything that might cause an allergic reaction. Fortunately, that's just what our listener did. I responded privately with this advice and heard back that their doctor is hoping that by eliminating more direct sources of barley, like bread and bagels, their body will be able to tolerate whiskey. Let's hope so. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. And that's also where you can find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, and a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you this week. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Make this Father's Day unforgettable with a personalized bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. Go to ReserveBar.com and use code GIFTDAD for exclusive pricing on an engraved bottle. Because if anyone deserves Blue Label, it's Dad. Please drink responsibly. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo, Norwalk, Connecticut. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.